Okay, so very quickly, a very important question to ask yourself is really what are you trying to forecast? What we're more going to focus on is it's you're going to try to work out which days you're going to take off next week to go flying, in which case you, know, you, have to, you could choose which day you take off and you want to work out where and when to go. It changes a bit if your time is fixed. If it's like, I know I've got this weekend to fly, where shall I go? That's a slightly different, uh, uh, you look at slightly different data. As you get closer to the time, uh, you know, it's the evening, what am I going to do tomorrow? Then once again, we've got more detailed data, but you're asking a different question. It's now, it's now what can I get out of this day rather than which day shall I take off? Finally, you're on launch in the morning, you're perhaps on a paragliding holiday, you want to know how much can I get out of this day, and that's then very short term um, forecasting. And at the extreme level, I'm in the air flying, what I'm going to do next. We're not, we are focusing on points two and three, basically. What day should I take off to go uh, flying next week, and um, where should I go? What makes a good XC day? Well, the phone XC, you've known this, but there's a few things that are kind of obvious which to look for little or no precipitation. Um, on the other hand, a little bit of precipitation, if it says showers in the afternoon or overdevelopment in the high ground, that's actually a good sign. That's a good sign that the, the thermals are going to be good. Um, one rule of thumb is if you want to look at the temperature at cloud tops, I think once it starts reaching minus 10 degrees at the cloud tops, then you start to get showers. Um, light winds at altitude, this of course is kind of an obvious thing, but we sort of also remember that uh, lift is basically moving air and wind is one way of moving air. So if there's, if there's strong winds at altitude, maybe there's different types of uh, lift available, be it dynamic lift on the peaks or uh, not in the outer of places, maybe wave lift. So this unstable air mass, we want good thermals, we want the thermals to go from the ground all up to cloud base, but if it's too unstable, then we get thunderstorms. So you want the right level of instability. Cumulus clouds, they're great, you know, they help us find the thermals, but if it's blue, then we, uh, thermal, um, cumulus clouds also is called shadows, so they can shade out large areas. Um, but if it's a blue day, then we're just gonna get sunshine all day and things could be much more predictable. Um, for the long and big XC days, you want thermals all day long. This becomes particularly important um, in the spring and the autumn before the, the um, outside of the long summer days. And if we're flying XC, you want good weather over a large area. Uh, one thing I find very interesting, if you look at the world record open distance flights, there's only a few places in the world that these get done. Currently Brazil, but historically it's been Texas, Australia, and South Africa. And the reason is, if you're gonna fly a world record distance, if you're gonna fly 500 kilometers, you need somewhere where that wind is gonna be blowing in the same direction for 500 kilometers. And that's quite rare. And here in the Alps, if we want to do a 150 kilometer flight, we need the, air, the weather to be good over a sufficiently large area for us to be able to reach, achieve our goals. <coughs> then there's the obvious spoilers, high cloud, development, storms, inversions. You're all very familiar with those. Um, I think it's worth remembering the XC days, if it's fantastic everywhere, it makes it very easy to predict where to go. Everywhere is good. It's quite, and in fact, you can fall into the trap of trying to micro analyze. You know, should I go to Fanas or Davos? Should I go to Fish or Rida You know, the, these minor differences, they don't make a big difference in the, the grand scheme of things. Um, the harder ones to forecast are when it's limited uh, our part of Switzerland where it's, uh, it's good. Should I go to the Alps or to Chino this weekend? Uh, extreme cases, there might be just one area which is, is flyable. Then you get locally flyable and of course, X Alps flyable. Um, basically, you know, the, the, it's, it's the stuff in the middle where you're trying to work out which part of Switzerland is going to be only exceedable in one, one or two regions. Then those, those are the more difficult days to forecast. The other ones, it's more obvious what you do. Either whatever you want or whatever you can get. Some good, some general rules that I tend to follow personally. The first a simple one is that good XC days come together. You can get individual isolated days um, where you know, it's just this one day in Ticino where it's not too much north wind and you can get in a triangle. But the, if you want the really easy stuff, just look for the long periods of good weather. There are huge numbers of forecasts to choose from. We're going to see real examples with Wessel Oleg and, and Bernie later. Um, that said, you can almost always find a forecast that tells you what you want. So if you want to go flying the next day, you'll find one that says it's going to be sunny and light winds. And if you don't want to go flying the next, way, uh, next day, you'll find one that says the wind's going to be too strong and there's going to be too much cloud and so on. A really good tip is find, choose one, one or two that work for you and learn how that particular forecast model relates to what you actually experience. 
And if, if you try to look at too many, you just end up too much, too much information and you'll end up effectively confusing yourself. You won't get a clear signal. Even if the forecasts are flawed, and I think we're some of particular will to talk about this, there are some things that have certain traits. Once you learn those traits, you'll be better able to interpret the forecasts. And finally, XC is not just about weather. Uh, you need to consider um, other factors in your flight, airspace, access to takeoff, XC route options. Um, airspace comes and goes, what's um, uh, obviously mill on, mill off is a classic example. Uh, access to takeoff in the spring, not all the ski lifts are open. Um, so don't, don't get, when the ski lifts are closed, don't bother doing forecasts for places where the ski, you need a ski lift to get to launch, unless you want to hike up, of course. Yeah. XC route options include, now we're all doing this for fun, don't just go away, get the big numbers, go to areas that interest you. For improving your personal XC forecasting, I think this is what I really want you all to take home from this particular thing, is if you as an individual want to get good at this, you have to set yourself a challenge of making predictions and then testing them afterwards. If you don't do this, then you will not learn. When you make your predictions, you should um, write down all the options that you consider and why you think it's either a good idea or a bad idea. Um, if you don't write down your reasoning, then after the day, you say, oh yeah, I went to fish, it was great. You will not learn much from that. You'll need to know why, but hang on, why were these other places better or worse? You can also, at this stage, you can cross-check with others. It's great, we've got a hangout for paragliding chat. It's great to ask on the chat, I think you're doing it, uh, going here, what do you think? Um, and ask others will, of course, um, chip in. But afterwards, and this is the most important part, is assess the accuracy of your prediction. Look at what happened, look at X contest, um, talk to people about what actually happened. And based on that, update how you interpret the models that you, that, uh, you were looking at. Um, here's an example of a personal forecast on a text, but this is what I would love to see people writing on our Hangouts chat. So I'm like, I'm planning to do X tomorrow because of these reasons. I also considered these other areas, but I don't think they're going to be good because of those reasons. Um, make some hard, uh, proper number predictions, base is going to be X, wind speed's going to be Y, etc. <coughs> then after the day, uh, at the end of the day, you can look back and see, was I right? And you can tune stuff so you're more right next time. Um, one a great resource for this is getting data from X contest. Um, there's so much information in a paragliding track log about the weather on the day, it's amazing. Obviously from thermal start time, all these things you can read. You can look at how um, pilots are they scratching close to the ground? Are they bouncing off of versions? How high did they get? Or what time of day did they get high? Hopefully, if people have uh, put photos up as well, you'll be able to see what the cloud development is, where the storms in the area, how big did the overdevelopment get? Are there are inversion layers in the photos? Um, you can look at drift on the track log to work out wind speed at different altitudes at different times, and of course, how long they get to fly. If you look at track logs, do not go looking at 8 p.m. on the same day, because the best pilots will not have submitted their, best, their flights yet. The best pilots uh, will be the people who are able to make the most out of the day. They'll get the strongest thermals, they'll they climb the highest in the, um, uh, in the thermals, they will uh, take off earliest and land latest, they will be less affected by inversions, etc. And they will, the big flights, they take time, and they'll only get posted much later in the day. So do your analysis after 10 p.m. or so, or you know, the next morning, once all the good flights are in. Um, so I have a very quick two minute check that I do for, spe uh, for spotting um, good days. It's really, really crude. And then these guys will give you proper, how to do it properly. This is, I do it all on the Meteo Swiss app. Um, I look initially at the six day overview. I look for groups of good days together. It's very simple. I then check the, uh, for the days that pro look promising. This was forecast from Sunday for this week. Tuesday and Wednesday look promising. Wednesday looks the most promising. I look at the mountain forecast. I look at the winds at different altitudes. You know, pretty for him. And what's a very good show is also the temperature, forecast temperatures at different altitudes. The ADAP particular lapse rate is 6.5 degrees per thousand meters, if I remember correctly. So if the, if the temperature difference is less than six degrees per thousand meters, then it's likely to be stable. 
And if the temperature difference is greater than seven or eight, then it's, um, it might be too unstable, you might get storms. Um, these people will give you much more technical information. And finally, for the gotchas, I look at the text report, it's in French here because I read French. Um, so it's in this particular case, officially, um, Wednesday looks, looks for quite a nice day. Um, the, the, there's a slight worry that it's going to be too stable because of um, uh, what we've received from the temperatures. And in fact, if we look at, for those of you who read French, um, there are, um, they're talking about for Tuesday, there's going to be um, clouds between 1,800 and 2,500 meters uh, in the mountains. So that means that layer is going to be quite humid and quite stable, and that probably means the thermals aren't going to be fantastic on um, Wednesday. It takes time for uh, the air mass to change. The winds aren't particularly strong. Um, so uh, I think Wednesday will be flyable, probably best to go to the high mountains where you can escape some stability, um, but it's not going to be an epic. It's flyable, but not an epic APC day. Well, that's my very quick two minute summary. And now I'll hand over to Wessel, who can uh, share out how he does it properly. Uh, all right, um, I'm just going to show you like briefly what I do. Um, it's not super technical. Um, I think these days we've got lots of tools and stuff that makes weather forecasting really easy for us. There's a, a bunch of smart guys that made smart tools that allows us to not, you don't need to have a very in-depth understanding of the weather to kind of see what it's going to be like um, the next day. Um, there's going to be a lot of overlap probably between the three of us because we all try to determine the same thing. Um, we've got slight different approaches like we discussed it last week a bit. And within a few minutes we realized like we all actually do the same thing. We just use different tools. Um, so we look a bit about, at the tools and um, yeah, make your own decision at the end what, what you like. Um, one thing that I noticed is that most of us use a um, like a three stage pattern to determine this. Um, we start looking a couple of days ahead, just briefly what it's going to look like, what the week is going to bring. Um, two or three days before the day, you start looking at a bit more detail because the forecast becomes a bit more, a bit more accurate. And then the day before, you start deciding like where exactly you're going to go, what strategy you're going to follow, and um, how can you make best use of, of the good weather that you're having. Um, all right, so we start with the, what I'd like to call the long-term forecast. Um, the only thing we're looking here for are generally days that are nice to be outside. Um, preferably days that are a couple of them in a row, like Tom said, usually if there's just one good day in the week, if you see the seven days ahead of time, like in seven days, that's not going to be the only one day. It's going to probably be a bit of a mix between the days before it and after it. So if you get two or three days that look good in a row, probably the middle one's the, the best bet to, to, to have good weather. Um, the only reason you do this is to give you a bit of an idea of is it worth rescheduling some meetings in advance. Um, <laughs> don't spend more than 10 minutes on this. Don't start typing in a Hangouts group that you're going to go to Davos on Friday. Just hang back a bit and, and see what happens. About two, three days ahead of time, the models start normalizing a bit. Um, the first thing that I usually check is has the forecast changed? Um, if there's been a massive change, then you know that the guys organizing these things are probably not too sure about, about the weather. And you can expect more changes as we get closer to the actual day. Um, if the weather forecast has stayed the same, that's usually a good sign. Um, you still don't need to go into much detail. Just check if it would be flyable around about 2 o'clock every day is what I usually do. That's kind of like the middle of the flying day. Um, I just check the wind, more or less what the strength would be at different altitudes, what the direction would be. Is there going to be rain? What time does it start, more or less? What does the cloud cover look like? Um, and just pick a couple of possible regions where you can go to. Is it going to be Bayo? Is it going to be the Engadin? Is it going to be Ticino? The day before, I check the same thing again. Has the forecast changed much for the same reason? And then I go a bit more into detail about wind development um, and not check just at two o'clock during the day, but actually see how it progresses during the day. Um, I should take a look at the cloud, precip cloud and precipitation, also the development throughout the day, what's going to happen with it, and um, instability and how that progresses through the day. It's nice to have a picture of what happens in the morning, what happens in the afternoon, and what happens in the early evening, um, so you can kind of expect what happens. The goal of this check is to pick the best region for the day, or make sure your flight goes through the parts at the right place at the right time. Um, and this also includes a bit for me, like planning your flight, like what, what route is going to be optimum for this kind of weather? Are you going to do 
fish the kur, um, but maybe kur gets shady in the afternoon because of some high cloud or something, then it's maybe better to go to Berenzona from fish. Um, is it a good day for triangles? If there's very little wind, are you going to do Grindelwald to Niesen or Niesen to Grindelwald, depending on the wind direction? Um, that's kind of the aim of the short-term check, and that is probably best done either at the end of the day at work or in the evening at home. Um, with regards to cloud and precipitation, um, I look for cloud cover and movement. How does it move during the day? Does the cloud base get higher in the afternoon? We usually have that. Um, does the cloud cover get more? Um, ECMWMF and Icon again, they like the two that I had the most luck with. Um, I tried to keep a bit of track like a couple of seasons, a couple of summers ago. I tried to write down like how many days actually matched up with Icon, with Cosmo, with, um, with all of these. And I find that Icon was the more reliable one, at least in that season. Good. What I then do as well is once I've got a bit of an idea of the route that I might want to fly, um, I compare certain key points along the route. Windy's got this nice feature where you can uh, we can compare different models and it gives you all in one screen like that. And then if you see like a day like this, um, like if there's some agreement here that it's gonna, that you're gonna have cloud a bit early. ECMWS says it might start later. So you can expect it around about three o'clock. Um, usually one of the models are right. And another tool I like to use is Meteor for a pump um, for the same reason. I do a bit of spot checks with it. Um, it gives you this wind gram that you get on the left side. Meteor for a pump is a paid service, but it's fairly cheap. It's 25 bucks a year, I think. Um, it's not as accurate as top firm or rec firm or alp firm or all the, all the other firms out there. Um, it uses RASP and GFS, whereas uh, top firm uses uh, uh, ICON and rec firm, which is the more modern version of it. But what I like about this is you can see here, it gives you kind of like the height of the boundary there. The yellow part is how high you can get on that day. Um, this is the wind at different altitudes. Um, this is on time, I have the time out so you can see a bit more of this with the wind direction, the wind strength. And I quite like this because you can see like around about noon, there's going to be a bit less wind. Um, the day ends pretty soon with lots of cloud. That gray part shows cloud. This is probably going to overdevelop if I look at this just based on this lot of sudden wind changes and direction changes. Um, but I like this to just give an idea of kind of like what you can expect in the air um, for the day. And I do this along the route that I plan to fly. Just click here and there to see what's what's kind of coming up. This is the Alternative to, uh, to Meteor Parapunt is the more fancy one, um, Rec Therm. Um, it kind of shows you the same thing. Like here you can see the cloud development as well. It starts a bit later in the day, um, massive cloud at the end of the day. What's also important is, um, like here you can see the cloud heights, you can see there's a lot of build up at the end of the day. Um, these little icons tell us that it starts with cumulus in the morning. Um, there might be some rain, these little green triangles, and thunderstorms in the afternoon. So that just tells you like how much of the day you've got. Um, is it going to be a long flight? Is it going to be a short flight? How it develops along the route that you're planning to fly? Um, I find that quite important. Uh, instability is the other thing we check. Um, that tells us how thermic it will be. Um, again, this is Meteor Parapunt. What I like about it is I'm not very good at reading these TCU diagrams. Um, what Meteor Parapunt does is it colors it for you a bit. So you can see this is green all the way. Green means we can fly with it nicely. Um, the red is strong, it's still flyable, but it might be a bit more exciting. And it gives you an overview map as well, which they color like this is more stable, green becomes a bit more unstable, blue is, is really strong. Usually the good days has a lot of green in it, with some blue spots. Um, days that has blue all over is usually days that has thunderstorms, and um, generally not that flyable. So this map also gives you kind of a, as you, you've got your flight plan in your head, it kind of gives you an idea of where to go, what's possible. Um, if there are inversions, they will show it with a little black line like this. This will be the inversion here. You can see the boundary layer is limited as well, so we won't get up to 2,000 meters in on this day, although there's lots of flight wind. One thing that I want to mention about Meteor Parapunt as well is it's got, it's got this weird area around the alleged gletcher that it always shows stable, and that's not always right. Um, for some reason, they've got this, I think it's a part of the model, maybe, maybe of the resolution or something, um, but they're now somewhere between, like, between Visp and Fish it always shows that it's a bit stable. It's not always the case. It's best to check around Furka to see, get an idea of what the, what the whole valley would be like. It's just a little tip that I've noticed. Um, this is a side note. Um, I noticed this, Martin Schill presented this at the um, weather talk from the XCD. Um, this is the uh, sea surface pressure that you get from, uh, from Cosmo, from the SHV uh, weather website. And he kind of says, go where it's green. Um, where the lower pressure is, um, thermals tend to, to trigger easier. Um, if we look then at wind development, look at the wind and decide where you want to go. Um, 
what kind of a flight you're going to do the day the next day it's much better to show up with a plan a flight plan that matches the weather than to to say it's going to be a good day and that we're going to go fly and we're going to see how far we can get because that kind of always ends up with you flying in the wrong direction or you get sudden wind in the afternoon or you get shaded out it's it helps to have a, have a bit of a plan um, it's also interesting to check the meteor wind to know how it's going to affect the belly winds um, a general good rule of thumb that I learned from Tom is that belly winds always flow upstream. They always tend to go towards the Furka Pass as well, which is kind of the middle of the Alps. Um, also a nice tool to check this is uh, Bernie's uh, fly map Switzerland that shows all the belly winds, which is which is really handy if you're not used to the or, or well into the, to the winds. Um, again, the aerogram, I picked this slide, it showed a terrible flying day based on all the cloud. But what I like about this is it shows the development of the wind throughout the day. So you can see in the morning you've got a wind, like an east wind, that gets a bit weaker during noon and not stronger in the afternoon. But if you look at the wind directions at different altitudes, especially in places like the Jura, where you fly where the ground is quite low and you've got a lot of air to play with, it's often handy to fly in one direction at one altitude and fly back uh, at a lower or a higher altitude with a different wind. So it's quite important to take a look at this. What you often have as well is that in the morning, the wind would be west and then it turns throughout the day and it's east in the afternoon, which makes for nice uh, out, in, out in the return flights. Um, again, this all boils down to, to just planning your flight. The last thing I check is uh, chance of fin, because that's less fun to play with. Um, familiarize yourself with the, uh, with the graph and what these things mean. Um, there's a line for Cosmo, there's a line for Icon, I think, uh, for ECMWF, sorry. Cosmo 1 is a really good model, actually. It's the, probably the best model we have available. It's got a 1.1 kilometer uh, uh, resolution. It's updated eight times a day, so it's something nice to fly with as well, actually, on your cockpit, if you can do that. And then lastly, on the day, um, were the conditions as expected when you get to the site? Um, if the forecast said it should be launchable around about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, um, like top task and, and meteor prop one kind of shows you what, what, time you can, what time you can launch. Does that match up? Is it a bit later? Is it a bit earlier? Um, just keep these things in mind. Um, like I said, it's Andy. I learned this from Oleg actually, just to keep the Meteor Swiss app open on your on your phone or whatever you have that can get actual wind readings. It's quite handy to have. And um, then at the end of the day, what Tom also said is analyze these things. Um, what did other people do? How high did they get? How fast were they flying? What did the wind do? Which directions did they go? And um, at the end, I think it's it's less important to find the perfect tool or something, but it's more important to get familiar with the tools you have. Um, all the models have differences. Some models are better at wind, some models are better predicting rain. Just stick to a few that you know, familiarize yourself with them, get a feeling for what they do, what are the, the caveats, what are the advantages. And um, yeah, uh, most importantly, if you're not at the right spot at the right time, don't panic. It's, it happens. I mean, there are, this is our, we're making guesses based on smart people's guesses. So it's, uh, it's bound to water down a bit at, at some point. That's it. Cool. Um, all right. So um, in a similar vein to, to these guys, I'll talk a little bit about what I do. Uh, I actually used the uh, I used last Friday as sort of the example day. Uh, I the the data that I have was a bit too close to the day, so you sort of you won't quite see the, the seven days ahead. But uh, we also have a pilot here who flew on Friday, so we will be able to check how how right or wrong I would it be. So um, much like Tom, I start quite simple. So uh, in my Meteor Swiss app, I set up uh, the common flight sites. So in this case, like I have Grinnell Wildfish, Zermatt and Locarno. Uh, I couldn't get all of them in there, but I also have like Engelberg and Davos and kind of the, the, the roughly equidistant, equidistant spread around uh, Switzerland. And I look for the next um, seven days to see basically what are the, what are the good days. Now this one is clearly, it boils down to spotting like the one good day in a bunch. Uh, so there was quite a lot of storms, but Friday here looks fairly reasonable outside of the really high mountains around Zermatt. Uh, the uh, screenshot that Tom showed is something that would be a little bit easier to, to make this call on when there's a, like clearly a block of, of three good days. So you know, starting here, like uh, Friday looks pretty interesting. So then um, once again, similar to Tom, I look at the winds and the temperature gradients. So I typically look for yeah six to seven degree drop between uh, 2,000 and 3,000. If uh, if this is later in the summer when uh, cloud base tends to be high, I also check the difference between three and 4,000. In the spring, this is not as important. It's very rare to get much above 3,000 in, in the spring. 
Uh, for uh, winds, I look uh, under 25 kilometers an hour. I find that the winds in the Meteor Swiss app tend to be a little bit overestimated than they are in practice. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the effect of the mountains or not, but generally the numbers are kind of like the free space wind and the wind near terrain seems to be lower. Uh, I pay particularly attention to north winds. And, uh, Every single major XC flight I had in the Alps and north wind conditions has been somewhere between not fun and scary. <laughs> I try to try to avoid those <laughs> from then on, unless I mean if I'm going soaring on a Lubeck or even some uh, or north facing slope in the Alps, it's a bit different. In this case, it's sort of fairly idealized conditions. The directions are all over the place, and the wind strength is like ten or under, which is effectively zero wind. Um, I often check the phone graph, uh, so you know Benny from Chilau, those who study with him, will tell you to not to not even look at this graph because it doesn't tell you the whole story. Uh, but particularly if you're, so for example, if I was looking at, um, you know, uh, if Monday looked like really sunny in Ticino and I was considering going there, and I look at this graph, I'm like, okay, yes, this explains why it's sunny in Ticino. So it's good to get a, a baseline idea, like is there likely to be to be fun. Uh, in this case, for Friday, it was only one day away. There's a slight north of a pressure and uh, phone is unlikely, but we'll get back to this a bit later. This theory here, like at this point, it's kind of like already, this is probably a pretty decent day. There's like, there's very light winds, there's good, good temperature gradient. So the thermals are the question. So will it get clouded over? Is there something that will spoil the day? So let's look at windy. Um, Similar to Wessel, I think Icon is one of the better models if you're in range for Icon. It's four days, it's at most four days out. So here I'm looking at the 2 p.m. Um, cloud cover. So the 2 p.m. cloud cover, this would be like, okay, this is, looks somewhat complicated. Uh, there's quite a bit of cloud in Bender Overland and um, over Andermatt. Uh, Valis looks fairly good. Uh, it is highly likely that a good flight from Valis would not be terribly difficult that day. However, leaving Valis would be significantly harder because you'll have to fight, probably fight your way under the shade in Andermatt. This is a snapshot at 2 p.m. Um, admittedly, I'm picking my screenshots a little bit carefully. It was a bit, it was a bit better earlier uh, the day. But if you were, for example, launched, launched late um, or were, were slow or got stuck in the stability early on and made it to Andermatt late in the day, you can expect that the pass crossing will be quite difficult or to get shaded out immediately after the after the crossing in this case. So not a, not a perfect day, but still the, the potential looks looks quite good. So overall Windy is amazing. I can probably do all of your predictions in Windy and not go to any other websites. To talk a little bit more about uh, the models that Vessel mentioned. So ECMWF is um, a nine kilometer grid. Um, it's, uh, it's nine days out. Uh, so you actually, can actually look quite, quite far out and see what are the likely days for it to be good. Uh, Icon is six kilometers. Uh, I did not know it's a triangle, so I learned something new today as well. Uh, it's uh, four days out, and uh, I also didn't agree that it tends to be somewhat more accurate. Uh, if you're uh, one warning for winds, uh, neither ECMWF nor Icon have enough resolution to catch the valley winds. Um, so if you're looking at surface winds and you care about the valley winds, uh, Cosmo is your bit better option. If you'd like to stick in Windy, the Arome model, which is a surface only model, will have the valley winds. It's only out, it's only one and a half days out, so it's only useful the day, the day before. It also only has surface winds, so there's you can't really make a mistake in it. I like guess it's, it's the only setting you got. Sticking to free tools, uh, I use a Soaring Medio as the sanity check. So th those were kind of the raw data, now we're getting to some sort of higher level, more like interpretation level data. So uh, gives you gives you a sense of basically how how likely is it to be thermic and the wind at altitude. So in this case, again, looking at looking at like things, things look like a pretty pretty certain bet in Valles, nearly 100 percent the thermal probability. Looks, um, I believe, the, the, so this is again 2 p.m. Looks pretty good actually all the way out to the beginning of the Soselva, and then once you get low towards core, things might get more difficult. Uh, Banner Oberland looks less good. Like, so in this case, you are likely confined to the main to the main ridge, which is not uncommon for late late summer. So generally, in this case, like everything sort of matches up. Like the like the forecast, the, the the baseline weather forecast is pretty good. The cloud cover and the uh, soaring meteor predictions generally match up. So, uh, if one wanted to fly far, it's perfect to go to Vales and try to do a triangle. There's no wind. You can. Um, 
could go back and forth. If one wanted to have a challenge, you could try to get over the passes. If one wanted to struggle, you can try to go to core. Uh, something that was not mentioned so far is that SHV and Meteor Swiss provide these wonderful gliding forecasts between April and September, which is the majority of the XC season. Uh, there's a two-day forecast. It's a, it's a text forecast in German. Uh, it's issued three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and it's for the two days following the day of, um, of the forecast um, and gives you like a nice kind of human readable summary of, of uh, what, the, what the upcoming two, two days are like. I read these uh, pretty much every time whenever there's something even remotely flyable looking just to, to learn and get a sense of like what other, what other people's predictions are and you know, people who are you know, very good at this. Uh, there's no forecast for Monday, so if you're Monday, it's, uh, it's, it's left as an exercise to the, to the pilot. Um, uh, there's also a 7.15 a.m. forecast every day during the flying season, which is generally very detailed. Uh, and that is something, uh, assuming one has the flexibility, I often use as the final sanity check for the day. Um, I cannot fly for eight hours, so it's generally for me, it's uh, I can you know, leave home after reading the 715 forecast and still be in fish early enough for my, my personal flying goals. Like it's still enough to fly you know, six or seven hours and that's, that's enough for me. Uh, also, if, uh, particularly for stuff like high cloud um, that sometimes I will miss in the, in the other forecasts or something that high, high cloud forecast tends, tends to surprise um, sort of the day off. And um, let's read this as an example again from uh, last, last Friday. I'm, I'm going to translate. Everything here, I need to, I'm not willing to embarrass myself with my German. <laughs> um, so this part is, is similar to the graph that you get um, uh, out of Meteo Swiss with the addition of the, the URI being a separate, uh, separate column here. So you'll get a sense of what's going on. Uh, uh, good, good place to check for potential inversions, uh, expected cloud bases, um, cloud covers, general, uh, uh, general patterns, uh, so in this case, there was a light, light bees attendance, and um, basically pretty much the, the the verbal summary that you'd get from a flight flight instructor like on the on the, mo on the morning off. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit more about wind. So in my personal feelings, on a day that is generally good, understanding the wind is the most important factor for safety. So understanding what the wind is doing when you're particularly when you're flying close to terrain as the day is developing, like. To me, like that is critical. I still feel I'm not good enough at it, and I get surprised. I'd like to believe I get surprised less often as the as the years go by, but it still happens. Uh, I have uh, my phone in front of me on the flight deck. Like so, in Switzerland, we have the luxury of excellent LTE connectivity in the air, as well as, as, well as uh, uh, real time weather stations. Uh, Meteo Swiss app or Winds.mobi website uh, are great and super useful. I check it in flight. If I'm flying from fish and I want to cross the passes and I want to know what will happen if I were to sink out into Realp, I will check the value in the Thunder Map. I'm like, okay, it's, you know, it's guessing 250, I probably will not want to land there. Okay. Uh, yeah. When you say you get surprised, what, what are the examples for surprise? Are they like sexy elements or? Um, so, I mean, I think, I feel like whenever I'm surprised by what the wind is doing, it's generally a failure on my part as a pilot to prepare to understand how the day is developing. Kind of um, so particularly, um, so northerly flows over over ridges is something that I still sometimes get you get surprised with. So uh, uh, visa in the flatlands uh, will I, I don't necessarily always think about like how much into the mountains it can push through. Uh, there was one flight that I did was from uh, kind of a, the classic sort of from fish to the to the east. Um, I had a southwesterly tailwind, so I sort of completely tuned out the, the wind. I crossed the Furka, I crossed the Oberal, I was kind of making my way to Strasella, I made it to about Trun, and I basically stopped. Like my ground speed went from 40 to 5. And it's because basically the, the bees actually pushed through basically past, past core and I kind, of, I kind of ran into it. Mm -hmm. It was not particularly a safety critical factor, I just realized that further XC will not happen today and I just turned and ran to, ran to descend this. Uh, but in a span of you know two or three kilometers, my, my ground speed went to one eighth of its previously, and it was like it was. I just didn't. I didn't check. I didn't. I did not allow for the possibility for the bees to push through. But even if I was if I was flying particularly close to the spines, and you get caught in the lee of the north of the northerly flow, like it can be a safety aspect as well. Uh, there's a couple of links that I put put in here. Um, 
with a quite quite nice also for a bit more wind explanation. Uh, so uh, to harp more a little bit about wind, uh, so Cosmo model, which again is accessible through the uh, through Meteor Swiss and through Meteor HV site, has the the high resolution. It's at one point one. Uh, no, Cos no, Cosmo One is one point one. Cosmo One. Sorry. No, Cosmo V is a bit bigger. Cosmo V is interesting because it's also part of ECMWF, um, and I believe on Meteor Swiss they actually combine the result before they show it in the Meteor Swiss app. Okay. Between the two of them, but it's it's. Uh, so uh, for Switzerland, this shows uh, very high resolution winds and uh, shows how it evolves um, uh, through the day. Uh, it will show major valley winds, certainly the stuff through, through the Goms, uh, through Aldor, the valley winds of Meiringen, uh, kind of the traditional places we'd expect strong valley winds. And going back a little bit to what I said about fun, uh, something that Benny likes to warn about is that you can have fun without a pressure difference. You can, you can have a significant pressure difference and no fun. Uh, uh, the, these generally will be captured in these models. Uh, the one that I often look is 800 meters above ground and then sort of the standard altitude slices. So in this case, you can clearly see the visa in the flatlands at the, on the 800 meters above ground. So something to consider. And the example that I just gave, you can see the visa wrapping around core quite nicely and uh, to sort of to be expected if one were to make it all the way over here. Um, at the at 3,000 meters, um, um, quite quite light light winds, but okay, again, the, yeah. yeah. For the previous one, yeah. like that's still fine, right? Like, you... It's fine. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, this is you know, 14 knots, so you know, close to 30 kilometers an hour wrapping around the corner at core. Mm -hmm. um, if I was if I was landing there, I would consider backtracking to the lands, for example, to land and not not fight into the into, directly into the strong wind. Uh, I mean, it's still below trim speed, but it might not already get sort of fairly unpleasant. Certainly, it can get much stronger than that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I must have, I did not get the, the 2000 model for that day. But uh, so the so when that uh, when the 3000 again slight visa influence can be seen. So something to to consider maybe as um, like as the day develops. I would try to st stay away from some of the spines. Overall, still very light winds. This generally we're looking at like six to ten. Knots. So overall, I would say like yeah, basically very like light winds. Have to be aware of the visa for the day. Thermals look decent. Um, probably not an amazing, easy to go everywhere day, but generally quite quite good. Um, and uh, with the risk of being shaded out by the by the growing clouds. Um, Wallace clearly had better forecasts than anywhere else. So if I basically if I wanted to have like a safe, relatively trouble free XC flight, I would go to Wallace. Uh, but other, other areas along the main Alpine crest uh, would likely work fine as well. North of the Alps, uh, things look significantly weak.